You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Today in the guest chair, we have Lisa Price, founder of multi-million dollar hair and beauty company, Carol's Daughter. I'm really honored to have Lisa in the guest chair because Carol's Daughter is a product that transformed my personal relationship with my hair and natural beauty. I learned about Carol's Daughter back in the day when I was in college, sophomore in college, and I used to have it shipped to my dorm room from Brooklyn, which was the only store at the time. And this is when I was a broke, I mean, broke college student. And I really had no business ordering anything online, especially on a regular basis. But that just goes to show how crucial it was for me to obtain this product that could actually moisturize and nourish my kinky threads. And since then, I have followed Lisa Price's entrepreneurial journey. If you don't know, Lisa Price and Carol's daughter has been in business for over two decades. In the early 1990s, Lisa began experimenting with making her own fragrances and perfume sprays when she wasn't busy working at her full-time job in TV production. In 1992, Lisa dedicated herself full-time to creating beauty products. With just $100 in cash, her own kitchen, and the simple notion that people should follow their hearts, Lisa started building the collection that would become a beauty revolution. In August of 1994, she officially established Carol's Daughter, the company lovingly named after her mother. Initially starting out with just a handful of steady customers, those numbers grew in leaps and bounds as women outside her neighborhood and circle of friends began to take notice. Today, Carol's Daughter sells millions of dollars worth of products having launched an exclusive collection in Target stores nationwide and on Target.com in March 2004, as well as extending into select Walgreens in March 2015. And as a culmination to the Carol's Daughter business trajectory, Lisa sold her company to L'Oreal USA in November 2014. Today on the show, Lisa walks us back through the journey of building Carol's Daughter to what it is today. Let's get right into it. Welcome to the guest chair, Lisa. Thank you. Happy to be here. Many of us know you as the founder and creator of Carol's Daughter, but tell us, how did your life experience, if you can look back, how did that experience of growing up influence your entrepreneurial fire? Well, when I look back at my life, as I've had to do many times during this journey, because you always got to look back to see where you're going. I was brought up in a West Indian family. My grandparents, my mother's parents, came here from Trinidad. So my mother was born here along with all of her brothers and sisters. And when they came here, they moved to Brooklyn. And my grandparents chose to obviously raise their children together. They had seven children, and my mother was the baby of seven, but also raised them in a neighborhood and a community where they had support from other immigrants from the West Indies, some being from Trinidad, some being from Barbados. They, you know, worked very hard at assimilating into the culture because that was how they could be successful. So my grandparents had West Indian accents, but not particularly strong accents. And my mom and my aunts and uncles don't have West Indian accents at all. They they have very Brooklyn accents and they're and they're very Brooklyn Italian, Brooklyn Jewish, Brooklyn Irish, and not so much African American Brooklyn, if you will, because that's what the neighborhood was like back then. And they raised all of us siblings and cousins together where to this day, my cousins are a lot like siblings to me because they kept us in that sort of close-knit community environment. And what I love about that is I never had this feeling of being alone. It wasn't just mommy and daddy. It was mommy and daddy and Nana and Gramps and auntie and cousin and, you know, and all of these, these people, this community 
So I learned the importance of having a village and not trying to do everything on your own. And I also knew what it felt like intimately to be supported and to be loved. So when it came time for me to build my business, I knew not to try and do everything by myself. I knew that I needed my village and I knew what things should feel like when they were correctly balanced because I knew what that support system felt like when you have the right people in place and the right people there for you. And then when it came to working, when I looked at my work history, because I came into entrepreneurship after having a career in television production and not a fancy glamorous career in television production. I was no one's producer, writer, or director. I was more of a clerical person in television production. I was a writer's assistant, a production coordinator, a script supervisor. But coming from that background where you have to function autonomously, there's very little micromanaging that goes on in that field because there just isn't enough of a, of a staff for that to occur. And because you're basically freelance, so your next gig depends on how well you're doing in your current gig and if someone's going to rehire you on their next project. So I learned how to work hard. I learned how to work long hours. I learned how to work weekends. I learned how to work holidays. And all of that turned out to be training for being an entrepreneur. I just didn't know it at the time. Many of my guests started their business as a side hustle, as you did, but they started it typically because they didn't love their jobs, but you actually loved your job, right? I did. I really did. What eventually made you start to make products and start to create Carol's Daughter? What I've always said, because, you know, this was something that was just sort of happening to me. It wasn't something that I was planning to do. Like I didn't sit down one day and say, OK, I'm going to start a business. Gee, what is it going to be? I was just happy at work. I really loved the flow of television production. I loved that it wasn't monotonous. There was a rhythm to it, but there wasn't a monotony to it. And it was creative without the full pressure of being the creative being at the forefront. It was, it was being in this creative process and helping that creation to come to life, but not actually having to author the creation. So it was just wonderful. So when I was home from work, when we would have a hiatus and, and we'd have a couple days off, and it was quiet, I think because I didn't have that feeling at work of, oh God, I hate it. I can't wait to get out of here. I hate it. When I was at home, I was more relaxed and I wasn't, I didn't feel that need to completely disconnect and break away from everything. So I'm just going to shout or I'm going to the park. You know, I was home and my creative juices were flowing because I was happy. And I began to make fragrances at first, and then I needed products to go with the fragrances. So I began to make products, but I really did it as a hobby, the way that, you know, anyone would go into the kitchen and, you know, maybe start to cook. You know, now today people order like blue apron and things like that, and they experiment and make Thai food. It was that kind of thing. Like, let me see what I can make. And, you know, you start to make things and you think they're pretty decent and you use them. And then you say, hey, mom, you want to have some or you know, Susie, you want to try this? And you start to give it to people. And that's how I began. And then my mother said to me, you should sell these at the church flea market. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. I think you would do well. And that was the first time that I thought about selling. And I was like, really, mommy, you think people would give me money for it? Which is hilarious now. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, it was a real serious question. Like, people will pay me for this stuff? So how did the church flea market go? And like, when did you decide to actually make a name and start to sell this for real? I actually decided to make the name before the church flea market because I was asked to make some oil by an actress who was on the Cosby show at the time, Erica Alexander. She asked me to make oil for her, for her hair, which I did. And she took it to the salon and when she took it to the salon, they were interested in talking to me about purchasing it. And I didn't want to walk into the meeting like totally rookie and all this kind of stuff. So someone helped me make a label 
so I could at least walk in with samples that had a label on it. And that's when I came up with a name to put on it. But I still didn't think of it as a business. I just felt like, you know, these people have this salon in New York. I can't not go and talk to them. I have to at least go and see what they say. And so that's how I came up with a name for the brand. I made a list of things I was and a list of things I wanted to become. And one of the things that I was was Carol's daughter. And I liked the way that it sounded. So I put that on that first label. The label was so not attractive when I think about it now. But, you know, I didn't know any better then. And and I just wanted to look sort of professional when I went in to see these people. And then I went in to see them and I realized, like, this is too much for me. I didn't know how to produce in bulk. I didn't know most of what they were talking about. And I didn't want to make myself look bad. And I felt like, you know, I just kind of do this as a hobby and they want like a real business person. And I don't know that I can guarantee all the things that they're asking for. So, you know, I just thank them and, you know, thanks for appreciating my product. And when I get to be more official, maybe I'll come back and talk to you then. And I think I left there feeling like, oh, gosh, you know, this is too much. And I didn't think about it again as a business until my mother said you should sell at the church flea market. And at at that point, I did have more products. When I first went to meet them, I only had this oil and they were, you know, just asking me to make things that I didn't know how to do. And they actually wanted me to copy an oil that they were currently purchasing from someone else. And they, you know, they wanted to get it less expensive. And, you know, I was just, and I know nothing about this business, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, but I can't copy that. That's her fragrance. And and they said, but can't you tell what it's made with? And I said, well, I, I have some idea of what ingredients she might have used, but I, you know, I can't tell you exactly off the top of my head. And I, I said, but I, I can't do that. Like, that, she made that. That's her creation. I can't mimic it for you. That's not right. <laughs> you know? so, and I guess they thought like, wow, this chick doesn't want to make any money. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just thought that was awful. So later when, you know, my mom suggested the flea market, I still had the name, but those labels that I had had made for that meeting, they were long gone and I didn't care for them anyway. So I ended up making some labels by hand because I didn't have time or money to go to another printer and do something. And then I didn't know after this flea market, is there going to be anything after that? So this kind of took off word of mouth, right? I mean, that's certainly how I heard of it. Maybe like 10 years later, I remember being a college student, hearing Mm -hmm. about it from someone. But by that time you had stores. But what happened between the church flea market to you opening your first store or even opening up shop in your apartment? (laughs) Well, it was definitely word of mouth. So that that first summer of 1993, that flea market was at the end of May. You know, so I'm at that flea market and I get a flyer for a craft fair in the neighborhood coming up two weeks later. And then I do that one. And then I find out about something else. And there's this community of people that this is what they do for a living. They do different craft fairs and flea markets. And This is how their wares get out into the public. You know, they don't have the overhead of a brick and mortar. And back then we didn't have websites. So I ended up selling on the street at these different craft fairs and things. And then you kind of learn which ones are worth your time and which ones are not. And I began to build a clientele that way. Well, the weather changed and it started to get cold. And there were less of these events that happen in New York when the weather is cold. And I wasn't really set up for, you know, setting up a generator and things like that. And, you know, being outside and in the dead of winter selling products. So when people would call me to get more, I started inviting them to my apartment because I was like, well, I guess that's the easiest way for me to do this because I'm not doing any craft fairs. And so that I guess they have to come here to shop. So I started setting up this bookcase in my living room when I began to see that I had a regular customer base because what was happening was I would, you know, bring the things out and sort of set it up on the coffee table when I knew someone was coming. But then it was getting to a point where I didn't always know who was coming and people would tell somebody, but they didn't tell me. And then a stranger would ring the doorbell. So I started setting up a permanent display in the living room so that I'd be ready in case someone randomly rang the bell. 
And it really was word of mouth. People would tell other people about it. People would call me. They'd make an appointment to come by or they would just show up. And initially, I was in a one-bedroom apartment with my husband. And then we moved to a larger apartment. And it had two bedrooms. And one of the rooms was supposed to be our bedroom. And then the other room was supposed to be this. There was this hall room um, that you had to enter. If, if you know Brownstones in, in Brooklyn, um, we were on the top floor and you could enter the apartment through one door, which took you into one of the rooms that was supposed to be a bedroom. And then you went around the corner past the closet and the bathroom and there was a huge room that could be a bedroom as well, but we made it our living room because it was so big. And then there was another room and you actually exited out into the hallway and then turned the corner and there was a little room there. And that was supposed to be my showroom because I'd be able to have guests in there without them ever entering my apartment. And I remember my husband looking at the space and he said, there is no way that your business is going to last in this space. It's too small. You should take the room right off of the kitchen, right when you enter. And then when people come to shop, they can come right into the showroom. They never have to go into the rest of our apartment and our apartment will be private. And then when you have to make products, the kitchen is right there. He was a thousand percent right because that was the busiest room ever. <laughs> once the business started to pick up even more, because once we had, you know, that apartment and that space, Cooking was easier. You know, I was cooking more product. I ended up getting wholesale business. The UPS guy was at my house every day coming to pick up orders to ship to people. And it just kept growing. And then after that apartment, when we outgrew that, we purchased the house that we live in today. And we continued to grow in our home until we opened up the official store in 1999. So to take it back a second, how were you coming up with these recipes? I mean, your background wasn't in this chemistry and science of fragrances, and yet you were coming up with new products. How did you do that? I did reading books on essential oils. I found within the books on essential oils were also recipes for massage oils and different types of moisturizers. And they were very sparse recipes, not, you know, not too extensive. And, but, you know, maybe it said something like olive oil, lanolin, and water, and then different essential oils. So I knew the lanolin was the emulsifier that's supposed to help the water and the oil mix together. So I would substitute something for lanolin because I knew enough about that particular market that someone wasn't going to be comfortable with lanolin because it's an animal byproduct. So I read that beeswax was an emulsifier. So I tried beeswax. Now, I didn't know if the ratios were going to work the same. So if it said, you know, two ounces of lanolin, I didn't know if two ounces of beeswax was the same thing. Turns out it's not. So there was a lot of experimentation in that way. And then I would make something with just the beeswax and the oil and the water and then I would think of it the way that you think of cooking. So if I add like cocoa butter to this or shea butter to this, and I knew about shea butter because I had traveled to Senegal when I was 19 years old, and that was my first encounter with shea butter. I didn't know where to buy it wholesale, but I knew that it was rich and really good for the skin. And I knew that it was something that was not easy to use by itself. Today, people are much more familiar with it because it's gotten so much more exposure. You can buy it on Amazon. You, you know, people can get their hands on raw shea butter. But back then, it was a very strange substance to people. It was very, very thick. People didn't like the way that it smelled. So they weren't really interested in it by itself. But it added a real richness into a cream when you added it as an ingredient. It gave it fullness. It gave it more body. It made it more luscious. And I've always loved cocoa butter. So when I started to experiment, I would just write down, okay, I'm going to try half a cup of cocoa butter and three tablespoons of shea butter and eight ounces of almond oil and an ounce of beeswax. And then I'm going to add a cup of water and we'll see what happens. And then I would watch what happened. Did it separate? Did it come out thick? Did it come out thin? 
And because I wrote it down every time I did it, when I got a recipe to be correct, then I knew how to duplicate it because I had it written in the book. Or if something was too thick, then I know I could go back and add more water or add more oil or vice versa. It's too thin. I need a little bit more wax. I need a little bit more butter. But that's what it was. It was just experimenting. And because it was a hobby, I didn't have pressure to like get it right. You know, there were no sales dependent on it. It, it, I was just in my kitchen cooking. Now you're in your kitchen. When did you start to, and what steps did you take to start taking Carol's daughter from a small mom and pop operation in your kitchen to full-fledged business? Well, it took a while for it to become something that I had to look at in that regard. So 1993 was that first flea market. I did have a doing business as certificate by 1994. And I started to track my expenses and the sales that I would get so that I could put things, you know, on my tax return. Everything was very small then. It was nothing huge. By about 1998, was when I officially became a corporation and began to employ people. Because at this point, things were, you know, it's not in a place where you can ask a friend to help and you can ask somebody to label. And, you know, my uncle came over and helped me get my order shipped out. You can't come every day, you know. And at that point, things were, these things need to happen every day. And my husband had a job, which was a big part of how our house ran. And then the business was fueling itself. And every now and then a little bit of business money could go into the house, you know. So my husband had to make sure that he went to work because that's how we had medical insurance and, you know, how we paid our bills. And then the business was paying for itself. So I was at a place where I needed to have employees who, you know, were showing up every day and had specific tasks and not just have people who were coming to help me out with my hobby. It's interesting that you mentioned the business was funding itself at this point. When did you start to reap profit from the business and what were the first things you invested back into it? I didn't draw a salary until... 99, somewhere between 99 and 2000, there was a salary for me to pull from it. And and that's because once you get to the point where you're incorporated, your tax situation becomes much different and, and you have to be more formal about things. When you're a sole proprietor and things are falling under your social security number, you still have to be careful and you have to keep records but your tax returns are kind of all one big tax return. And when you're a corporation and you have employees, your taxes are separate. So at that point, it was better for whatever money I would be able to earn for it to come in the form of a formal payroll check. It wasn't any great salary, but it was something. And it was the beginning of divesting things and that's the business and this is personal because you do get to that point when you're, you know, your business gets to a certain level, you have to separate it. It can't continuously coexist within your personal finances. Speaking of getting to a certain level, so around 2000, you'd been in business for what, seven or so years and you'd started to gain the attention of magazines, celebrities. Talk to us about that. How did your business change when the likes of Essence or even Oprah became aware of Carol's Daughter? Well, Essence was a fan of Carol's Daughter early on, which was always wonderful. And, you know, I don't know where I would be had it not been for Essence. Because the first time that they featured the brand, they had featured a gift basket. And I remember people telling me, oh, if you're going to be in Essence magazine, you better have like hundreds of those baskets ready because people are just going to order it like crazy. (laughs) And I felt like, you know what, if anybody orders it, I'll just tell them when they place the order, because back then you didn't have a website. So people had to call you on the phone. They had to call your number. And I didn't have an 800 number at the time. So I was like, you know, if a bunch of orders come in, I'll just have to talk to people and tell them to be patient and (laughs) order out as quickly as possible. And I sort of made a list of if something happens and I get like 200 orders for this gift basket, this is all the stuff I would have to buy. 
and this is what I would have to make. And I would need, you know, four days to get all of this stuff done. And then I could ship. And I was like, if people can't wait four days, then I I can't help them. But there, I just refuse to go out and invest in the 200 gift baskets when I didn't know who was going to buy them. And it turns out I did the right thing. I think I sold three of those gift baskets. Then the next issue of the magazine was the January issue, which came out in December. And a friend of mine who had a salon mentioned my product in an article in Essence. And it said, to moisturize her lock, we used lock butter by Carol's daughter. That's all it said. Didn't say what was in the lock butter, what it smells like, how much it costs. To moisturize her lock, we used Carol's daughter lock butter. My phone rang off the hook. Wholesalers called me. Can we get the lock butter for our salon? Can we get the lock butter for our store? And I was like, oh, my God. Like, everybody thought it was going to come from the gift basket. (laughs) And it came from these, like, seven words. (laughs) To moisturize our locks. And that was the beginning of like me having wholesale business and things like that. But, you know, so that is one of those like changing moments, but still not, you know, it's not like all of a sudden I was a household name or anything like that. It was just one of those shifts, you know, where you feel like, okay, things are different now. And I began to ship more regularly to wholesale accounts and I began to have a, a, a group of people that ordered on a regular basis from other states. And, you know, I started to know the UPS man better. <laughs> and then as far as celebrity goes, Jada Pinkett Smith was a fan of the brand. And I didn't realize that she was a fan of the brand for many years because somehow Jazzy Jeff had found us and Jazzy Jeff ordered things and sent them to Jada. In 97 or 98, somewhere in there, we had a customer service service that was based in Arizona because we couldn't handle answering the phone as much as it needed to be answered because the people who were answering the phone were also helping with customers who rang the doorbell. They were helping send out orders and different things. And, you know, when people call customer service, they want somebody to stay on the phone with them. And my people were kind of distracted. And then people would think it was rude. You know, like if somebody said, oh, hold on for a second, I need to go get the door. And then they would go get the door for a customer. And then they would come back and say, you know, oh, you know, Miss So-and-so, can I call you back? Because a customer just got here and I have to help her right now, but I'll call you as soon as she's gone. And if they didn't call back fast enough or if that customer turned into three more customers, oh. then you never called me back. And why did I have to wait three hours? And that's rude. I was on the phone first. And, you know, so the service used to write up orders for Jess Towns as Jess Towns. So the orders always said J-E-S-S in Philly. And we used to make jokes like this girl, Jess, loves the stuff. (laughs) So much stuff. And it was like years later that I found out that it was Jeff sending stuff to Jada because I finally got to talk to Jada. And she was like, oh, yeah, um, Jeff has been sending me your products for years. And I was like, Jeff? And then she said, yeah, Jeff Towns. He lives in Philly, but he always sends stuff to us in L.A. And I was like, oh, my God. (laughs) But the the celebrity word of mouth was always something, you know, that I I was very proud of. And it it was very, you know, interesting to experience it. And it wasn't something that I sought out. It just kind of happened. And I think it happened in some ways because at that time, there were just so few products like this, not just like this from an African-American person, but like this period. And, you know, I working in television and film production, there would be uh, hair people that would find out what I did. And, you know, they would ask me for a sample of something. I'd bring some things in. And then they're working on a shoot, you know, two months later. And they're like, hey, I've got an actor. He's got locks. Can you send me some of your stuff? Because what they have for us just doesn't work for him. And I want to make sure his hair looks really good. Today, people can go to CVS and find like, you know, lots of options. But back then, 
it just wasn't there. So people were much more loyal. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that to say like they're not loyal today. They just they can just be loyal in a different way, you know, and you had to do more work to find stuff like Carol's Daughter or Jane Carter Solution. Um, we just weren't available everywhere and you didn't have Amazon and you didn't have websites. So, you know, people kept their connections with brands like ours that were much more independent and niche. And then you ended up developing really good relationships with people. Nowadays, you're right. You can go into CVS. You have your pick of natural hair brands. But I remember being in college my sophomore year and going natural. And back then it wasn't like I wasn't on trend. OK, <laughs> like yeah. me and my Afro puff was the only Afro puff for like a year. And then more started creeping in. And I had to dig to figure out what to put on my hair. Luckily, my friend's mom recommended this. So I was ordering product from Brooklyn. I remember this distinctly because I shouldn't have. I really shouldn't have been. I was a broke college student, but I was like, this is the only product I know out there that is specifically made for my hair. And then when other girls on campus started going natural, of course, I would recommend it because it, again, was the only product I knew was specifically for natural hair. But now that things have changed and natural hair has definitely become more on trend, what has changed in how you've marketed your business? And, you know, obviously your websites are now there. Facebook is now there. What was that shift like? There, I mean, there's been so many shifts in how we go to market because initially, when we went to retailers, it wasn't an option to go to a CVS because the market at that time was the ethnic hair care market. And the ethnic hair care market at that time was relaxers. So even though there were, you know, these people in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, that what I refer to as the first, well, not the first, but one of the first go natural movements the going natural, that was the term then. I decided to go natural. I went natural. I'm going natural. It wasn't until 2009, 2010, when you heard transitioning. Because in 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, you didn't have ceramic flat iron. So you didn't have a way to achieve that straight look without the relaxer. And when people decided to go natural back then, it was literally an overnight decision. I'm cutting off all of my hair. So now I have no hair on my head and the hair that's on my head is virgin and I'm never putting another relaxer in it. And we're going to see what this journey looks like. Or I have hair on my head, but now I'm going to braid it and I'm going to keep it braided until all of my relaxer grows out. And then I'm going to cut off my relaxer. And then I still might keep it braided because I don't know what I look like with short hair or I'm going to lock the hair that's on my head, and that's going to be how I go natural. So that group of people was a smaller group of people because it was such a radical shift in what they did. And not everybody could do that given their work situation, their confidence level, the shape of their face, whatever it was that would make them go, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Where later, when it became transitioning, you could sort of ease into it because if you could find a stylist that would work with you, she would be like, okay, yeah, let me flat iron your virgin hair and let's see how long we could go and we won't relax it. Also in 2009, 2010, you had YouTube coming into being and you have all of these young people on college campuses deciding because they are away from their beautician that maybe they're going to give this thing a try. And because they're younger, they're on YouTube more than the rest of us. So they start sharing the videos and look at what this one did with her hair and look at how she did this. And she mixed up some coconut oil with some water and put it in a spray bottle. And that's how she got her curls to do so-and-so. And people began to not be as reliant on the relaxer. Then also at that same time, 2009, 2010, good hair comes out. Chris Rock's documentary about hair. And that was the first time that a lot of people realized how caustic the relaxer solution was. And seeing that can of soda dissolve in that relaxer solution made a lot of people say, wait, what? That's what I put on my head? Oh, no. And it made them look for something different and do something different. 
So in the in the beginning part, in the 2004, 2005, 2006 part of things, I couldn't go into mass because I didn't have relaxers. And that's all they knew. That's what 89% of African-American women did to their hair. 89% of African-American women in those early 2000s relaxed their hair. So I had to go into prestige, into Sephora and into department stores with a natural beauty angle. And being there at first, low hanging fruit was African-American customers. Ooh, girl, look, Carol's daughter's at Macy's. Carol's daughter's at Sephora, blah, blah, blah. But to survive in that environment and then to subsequently go on HSN and keep on selling, you can't keep telling the same story because now you're no longer new. I'm not the new African-American brand that's in Sephora that everybody's excited about. I have to be the efficacious brand. I have to be the natural brand. I have to be the brand that's talking about shea butter and coconut oil and manoi oil and macadamia oil and all these other things and has these great fragrances. And I need to be able to sell not just to my demographic because my demographic doesn't walk into those stores at a great level looking for hair care and body. Because again, at that time, a lot of them are relaxing. So they're going to the beauty supply place and they're going to their salon to get their hair done. They're not walking into Sephora to pick up their hair care products. So marketing was different then. Then you have the shift happen in 2009 and 2010. And we realized, okay, there's a whole bunch of people out here that think that we are only for natural hair and we're not for anybody else. That's what was kind of happening before that shift. And then when people shifted to natural hair, they didn't know what we did because we were marketing hair in general and sort of like problem solution. So we had to beef up our YouTube identity and have DIY videos and, and kind of remind this younger generation, you know, Carol's daughter has been here since like 1993 with this stuff, right? Like the stuff that you mixing up in the kitchen and doing from scratch, we've had it in jars <laughs> <laughs> with, with labels on it. For like a right. long time, uh, you know, so then you shift it again. It's still your same message and it's still your same DNA, but you have to change the way that you tell the story in order to capture the new audience that's available. So I feel like we do those little pivots a lot and I feel like that's how you survive. A lot has changed in your business since you first got started, including taking on investors. When did you decide that you wanted to do that? At what point had you scaled to that you knew that you wanted investors? It was 2004 and I had been on Oprah. I had had growth in sales, but for the first time, my growth between 2003 and 2004 was really tiny. Because before that, the growth spurts were bigger. They were a bit more dramatic. And I feel like when you get to, in, in my business anyway, I can't speak for everyone. And then, of course, I don't know what it's like today. But at that time, when you got to the point where you cross the million dollar in sales threshold, I feel like there's a lot more scrutiny there's more things you need to pay attention to from a tax perspective. Not that before that you're sloppy because I don't feel like I was ever sloppy. And, you know, my accountant did my quarterly returns and my monthly sales tax returns, like all those things were always taken care of, but it's almost like you're legit now. And, you know, like you're not in that fishbowl anymore. And it's like, Oh, you got to a million. Okay. So there's more, responsibilities and things that you have to take care of and be mindful of. And those things cost. So as the business grew, the cost also grew, but they didn't necessarily grow at the same rate. So when things were smaller, like your profit margins were a little bit bigger. So you, you had a little more flexibility and a little more cushion. And now everything just feels like super tight, you know? And I couldn't figure out how to grow. And I was looking at things that I needed. I needed new labels because my labels were not easy to read and they, they weren't shell friendly at, at, at this particular point in time. So this is before I'm in Sephora and Macy's. This is 2003. 
and I needed a better phone system because at this point we did have customer service reps, but we didn't have a rollover system where the calls could roll over to multiple lines. So people were getting busy signals and they hated busy signals. And then I, I also needed to make upgrades to my website. And each one of those things had a price tag between 80 and $110,000. So I didn't have 80 and I didn't have 300 either. So I needed to pick one and try to figure out how to pay for one. And the one that I ended up picking was the customer service. And it wasn't necessarily because it was the one that was going to give me the best bang for my buck, but it was the one I could finance. So I didn't have to pay the $85,000 for the upgrade at once. I could finance it over five years and put in a new phone system. And at least that enabled me to get more people on the phone and hopefully take in more orders. So I realized there's only but so much more growth I can get on my own. And I got myself one to Oprah Winfrey. It worked into me getting a book deal. I can't do much else on my own. So if this is supposed to grow, it's going to have to grow with help. And, and I think because at that moment, I allowed myself to allow the thought of someone else coming in, people began to come to me to do that. And then it was just a matter of me interviewing them until I found the right person. So you ultimately sold, you were acquired by L'Oreal. And I don't think everyone understands the benefits of selling versus remaining privately owned. You briefly touched on it, but your business had scaled to a certain level. Can you share your perspective on selling versus remaining privately owned? Well, what some people don't understand is when you take on investors into your business, and I, I had some investors who invested with me early on, and then I also had equity partners. And all of those individuals and companies need to exit. So what I realized in, in going through this process was even though I never kept it a secret that I had investors, like we actually made press announcements when investors came on board, the public didn't understand what that meant. So I knew that having investors meant at some point I was going to have to have an exit strategy because people invest in order to make money. Somebody gives you $30 today, and they hope that they're going to get $90 later after you make some profit. So unless I was suddenly going to become a really wealthy person and be able to write everybody checks for, you know, not just the money that they put in, but also the money they were expecting to get out of the deal, an exit strategy with a strategic partner was the only option because I don't happen to be a multimillionaire that could sit down and, you know, write checks like this. So I realized when people were upset about me having sold and that people were looking at it from the perspective of, well, you know, she was desperate. Her stores were struggling. So I guess this was the only thing that she could do to generate some money. And it was like my last ditch effort to get some money out of the brand. That wasn't the case at all. I, so I knew for five years, seven, I'm sorry, seven years that there was going to be an exit at some point. I just wanted it to be the right one. And what I realized that the public never knew that that was the case. And they just assumed that it would always be private and that, you know, I was doing these things with the help of investors, but those investors never really wanted to get anything out of the deal. So I'm in a, I'm in a situation at that time that isn't something that's sustainable. My equity partners, we're expecting to exit within three to five years. We were at seven years. They were lovely to me and very patient with me. And we went seven years because at the time that we did the deal, we did the deal at the end of 2007. And then we had the worst recession ever in 2008 and 2009. So because they were wonderful uh, partners, they allowed extra time for you know, the, the world to reset, for the economy to adjust and for things, you know, to get better. But they weren't going to be in that game forever. We met with different companies. And from the beginning, I always felt that L'Oreal was the best home for me and the best home for my brand. 
And I worked very, very hard to make the brand attractive to a company like L'Oreal. And my team worked very hard. And when we were able to successfully accomplish that acquisition, it was definitely one of the most proudest moments in my life because it was a culmination of about not just the 20 some odd years that I had been in business up until that point, but it was about 24 months of really, really hard work on the business, on the brand, on marketing, on how we sell, how we operate, how we communicate with each other. And it was definitely about three, three and a half years of me working on myself and making myself a stronger, smarter, more effective business person, more knowledgeable. So it's, it was something that I was and still am extremely proud of. So it was very disconcerting when, you know, that triumph was met with, oh my God, how could she do this? She's a sellout. You know, it's like, wait, wait, what? Huh? Wait, whoa, wait, hold on. <laughs> Right. This was a good thing, guys. It works. Like lots of companies go public. Lots of companies get acquired. But I think there's still an opportunity for education within our community and understanding that, you know, you're still there and this is still wealth that is going to your family. You're not letting go of this, but there are things that need to happen when a business scales. Like you said, like you now have more customers and each one of those customers has a cost. And if your business is still earning at the same level, then your profit margin is just shrinking year over year over year. So I'm glad you touched on that. And big congratulations. I mean, especially it's especially meaningful for me to see how you've grown as someone who remembers your product in the early, early stages and getting just that plain white label. Mm -hmm. And now I see the flourish when I go into the stores. (laughs) I'm like, we have different colors. (laughs) I love it. I know. Like I, sometimes when, when I sit in meetings, it's like, it, it's so funny because, you know, you'll get samples from a vendor, you know, you're switching vendors because you can get a better cost. And so they do like a mock-up of your packaging and, you know, you get the lids in and, you know, someone from the packaging department is saying, well, we were happy with the gauge of the plastic and the finish but unfortunately, the color match is a little off and it's a bit red. So they're going to rerun it and get it to match, you know, what we currently have on shelf. And I'm very grateful for all of that because that's exactly what they're there to do. And, you know, that's what their job is. But I just remember when I used to order my own supplies and sometimes my caps were black, sometimes <laughs> they were white and sometimes they were clear because it depended on what I could get on sale. That's real. <laughs> And now we're, you know, we're, we're fussing over, there's a little too much red in the pigment of the brown and, you know, they need to put a bit more blue in it. How far we've come. I I know (laughs) it's crazy. So before we transition to the lightning round, I'd love to know holistically, if you just look back, what would you say was the most challenging or surprising aspect of entrepreneurship? Challenging and surprising was how much is required of you as an individual to change so much about how you do everything. I had to get over so many fears in order to continue where the business is today. And I am basically an introvert and I have learned how to do extroverted things. And I've learned how to manage my energy level because I'm an introvert. I know that if I have to do X number of days of extroverted activity, it needs to be balanced with introverted activity. So like, for example, last week was a very busy week for me. I had a meeting with a retailer in, a, in another city that I flew to, flew back, then flew to HSN, had a meeting there and had a show and, the, and my daughter also graduated from middle school last week. And then we were celebrating this weekend. I have your interview today. I have a big meeting this afternoon. And then tomorrow I'm doing Wendy Williams and I have a panel that I'm on tomorrow night. So Wednesday, <laughs> I'm not talking to anybody. And I will be at home and I'm going to go to Soul Cycle class and I'm going to get a massage. And then I'm going to come home and pack for Essence because Once I hit Essence on Thursday, from Thursday to Sunday, I have to talk and smile and take pictures and shake hands and 
speak and, you know, and if I don't budget myself appropriately, I can't do it. And it took learning that and it took getting sick and falling and not being able to function to learn how to say, okay, I've got to do this for eight days straight. So then for two days, (laughs) y'all not going to see me. And then I'll come back, you know, because you have to, you have to be able to, to manage that. And then when, when you have to do things when you don't feel like it, you know, so I had the experience of finding out that my uncle died two hours before I had to go on air and do like eight shows on HSN. And, you know, people worry about you and they're concerned about you and, you know, they feel bad, but the bottom line is you've got $2.4 million worth of stuff to sell that's built into your budget and you don't have the option of, I can't do this right now. And you figure it out. And those are things that I never even thought I could do. And then found out in the middle of it, oh, this is what I have to do. So I better figure it out. And that was surprising. You know, and in the end, it gets easier. You know, I've gotten to a place now when I do HSN where the camera light goes on and it's like, I just turn into another person and I get done what needs to be done. And I can, I can almost separate like, okay, now I have to turn Lisa off and I got to turn Carol's daughter on and I can be that person and do what I need to do. But it came from getting on air while I'm sick, being on air while I'm sad, being on air while I'm worried, you know? So you have all of those experiences and then each time you get through, it's like, man, I didn't think I was going to have a voice but I made it through. Ooh, that fever, thank God it stayed at 101 until I went off air. You know, like you just, you roll with it and you learn how to do it, but you never know that going into it, that it's going to be that challenging and that you can even rise to the challenge. And it's absolutely remarkable when you learn how resilient you really are. I relate to you on so many levels. The introvert, with extroverted tendencies is how I describe myself. And so I completely relate to having to just go in hiding after like days and days on end of activity. Yeah, I went to a summit and at that summit, a woman had written a book and the woman was an introvert who had to do extroverted work. And she, and she said the biggest lesson that she learned in living her life was just because you're an introvert doesn't mean you can't do extroverted things. You just have to balance your energy so that you can survive it. And she talked about how she would, if, if time permitted, she would check into a hotel maybe the day before she had to give a speech because she was a working mom. So she was busy when she was at home. And she said she could check into the hotel maybe the day before, stay in her room and read and order room service or watch television. Or if it's a sunny place, go down to the pool But then she would go down to the pool with her headphones in and a book, even though she might not be reading and she might not be listening to anything, she could tune out and it would it would help her be better the next day when she had to speak. And she and she said before she learned how to do that, she would fly in the morning of and then run up to the stage and make the speech and then, you know, fly out to get back home and take care of the kids. And then she just found that she couldn't find her center, you know, like her rhythm was just off and everything was so difficult. And it wasn't until she learned how to manage the time and cheat and take, you know what, I need three day, three hours for myself at the top of this trip. I'm going to get there a little bit early. I want to check into the hotel at four. I want to have an early dinner. I want to get a good night's sleep. And then she'd get up the next day and bang out the speech be better than ever, you know? And I was listening to her talk and I was like, oh my God, that's me. Oh my God, that's genius. I need to do that, you know, because I always thought I was lacking or suffering because I didn't know how to be extroverted. And I didn't realize that I was already doing extroverted things. I just was doing too much of them too many days in a row. And I just had to learn how to turn off and be okay with it. I love that. I love that. Alrighty, we are going to transition to the lightning round. Basically, you just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Number one, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? 
having a lawyer that I trust and an accountant that I trust, they're invaluable to me, invaluable. And if you don't have them, you have to find them. I don't know what I would do without the lawyers that I've had and the accountants that I've had. Number two, what's been the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? This is going back, I think, maybe two years, but Girl Boss, I loved because it was so real and because she learned how to be a business person along the way. And there's so many entrepreneurs that are like that. And we just, we don't know what we're doing and we're so afraid of screwing up and screwing up is okay. It's how you learn. Number three, who inspires you and why? I am inspired by a lot of people that I follow on Instagram, the younger generation, the bloggers, you know, people like you that are, are doing this entrepreneurial thing in a very different way, because with social media, it's, it's, your your marketing skills kind of have to be in tune early. You know, I was in my kitchen for a long time before anybody knew what I even looked like. You know, I didn't have a makeup artist and a stylist to, you know, like put, put my stuff together for me for many years. And now if you're venturing into business, you have to understand what does my brand look like? What do I look like on social? How do I sell myself? How do I let people know what I'm about and what I do? So it forces you to already be so many steps ahead in business that I didn't have to worry about for years when I first started. So I'm very inspired and impressed about how people have navigated that. And I've, and I've actually watched people go from being um, a YouTube celebrity, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. I mean it in a very loving way. Um, going from being a YouTube celebrity who, you know, was, they were basically teaching people how to style their hair and maybe they dabbled in, you know, some recipes and formulations of things. And then some of those people are now sitting on shelves next to me in stores with real products that grew out of those YouTube years. And I just, I just think that that's remarkable because you, that doesn't just happen. Like, like, it's, it's a, it's a learning and, and their learning curve was like so much shorter than mine. You know, like this is something that they accomplished in four years or five years. And it took me, I, I, I wasn't on CVS shelves until 2016, <laughs> you know, and I started in 1993. And, and then some people have come from that space of hair and then they've turned it into activism and empowerment and politics and uh, holistic living and health. And that that just, I, I love watching that. I, I, I know it makes me sound like an old person. <laughs> I love watching the young people. <laughs> but it's true. You know, some of these people could be my daughters, you know, I'm, I'm 55 years old, but I just, I wasn't that together at 32 and 33 and 34. I was still figuring a bunch of stuff out. And, and these chicks are out here running it. it. It's amazing. Number four, what's a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? The way that I handle and feel about money. I learned a long time ago that money is an energy and it has to flow. You can't keep giving it away. And you can't hoard it. It's got to move back and forth. I organize my bills in my wallet. I always know what is in there. And, and someone taught me that a long time ago, that if your wallet is sloppy and your money's all over the place, then you don't know what you have. You don't know what you need. So you should always know what you have. And then you know what you need. Um, I have less cash now because I don't have to handle cash to do business, but I still make sure that I know what's in my wallet so I don't go to the ATM if I don't have to. And I have to look at like balances and things like that because we're not so much cash. You know, I have to look at like my PayPal and my Venmo and pay attention to what's going out and who I took care of and what balances I have and 
It's not like I'm sitting around counting, but it's that awareness of what I have so that I know what I need. Finally, number five, what's your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? Once you make the decision to step out and do it, you'll learn how to live without the paycheck. But don't step out and do it and be like, girl, I just decided I was going to quit my job and I'm just going to do this business thing full time and you don't have anything in the bank. Don't do that. Can people be successful that way? Yes, they can. Do we have to prove that we're super women all the time and do amazing Herculean tasks? No, we don't have to do that. So plan it so that when you do decide to step away from what you're doing today and pursue your business full time, plan it in such a way that you have money in the bank, at least when you first start, so that you know you've got a six month, a nine month, a 12 month runway to get your income going. But until that happens, you can eat, you can pay the rent, you can go to the doctor. And then once you're in it, you figure it out as you go along. There's really no manual. There's no magic book that's going to give you the answers. Other people's books will be helpful. Podcasts are helpful. Uh, Panels are helpful because it's helpful to step outside of your world and realize that there are other people who have the same issues that you have, especially if you don't have friends who are entrepreneurs. If your friends all have jobs, (laughs) you're like a weirdo. So you need to be around other weirdos so that you can feel normal, but you don't get the answers from those places. You learn the answers for yourself because your journey is not anybody else's journey. The other information that you get just helps you along the way, but you figure it out as you do it. There's no having it all figured out and laid out before you step forward. You're going to take a leap of faith no matter what, but take a leap of faith with some money. What a great note to end on. So what's the best (laughs) way that we can connect with you after this episode? You can follow me on Instagram. My handle is I am Lisa Price. That's also my Twitter handle, but I'll be honest, I'm not a big Twitter person. And Facebook, I'm on Facebook as Lisa Price. And that's a great way to be in touch. I'm a big Instagram person. um, So most of my activity starts on Instagram and it funnels into Facebook. And every now and then I tweet, but I don't tweet a lot because I just can't keep up with so many <laughs> I know things. how you feel. Well, I am a big Instagram person too, so that's perfect. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair today, Lisa. This was awesome. Thank you. All right, guys. And there you have it. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the side hustle pro Facebook community. Go to side hustle pro.co forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe rate and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.